Okay, let me first yeah, thank the organizers to invite me to this interesting workshop and also yeah, the uh, whole cavity picture was also nice education for me and also yeah, very interesting discussions already here on this exciting topic of this tantal and nickel selenide and I want to give us our efforts to find somehow a coherent order parameter dynamics in this system to really use ultrafast optics to somehow find fingerprints of coherence in this system directly or more directly. Okay, since we had already these nice speakers, okay, we are dealing with this situation where we have this small band gap uh, semiconductor or a small band with semi metal where the external binding energy is larger than this band gap or the band width of the system that allows then a formation of excitons and this opening of this characteristic type of uh, uh, band flattening and then at low temperatures these systems semi metallic case in a BCS type of fashion or in a semiconducting case in a VEC type of fashion could then potentially condense forming this elusive state of this excitonic insulator. There are several candidates in the system. So this we have seen already this titanium uh, diselenide, which is a system where there is the problem you have an indirect band gap in the system. So you always have the problem that also you have the charge density waves in this material. And then it's difficult to disentangle really excitonic order from the density wave order. And there are also efforts in time domain methods to tackle this. For example, there are time resolved ARPES measurements that try to compare how is the typical dynamics of mod gaps, which would be then really prompt, then on typical systems where you have a pile gap where you really see the opening of the system with this, yeah, on the time scales of the amplitude modes of the charge density waves. And for example, in this titanium diselenide, there are measurements that then gave an intermediate time scale in principle. They were then interpreted as this build up of the, of the screening in the system. So that is what, what time resolved methods uh, tackled this problem uh, in time resolved office Stephen, first. Yeah. I know that this is not the right moment to start. We go to the first slide. <laughs> this one? <laughs> okay. If I ask you as experimentalists, yeah. Why do you think there is a way for a direct band gap semiconductor to get an exciton binding energy larger than the gap? What is the physical mechanism that can give you that? Oh, the physical mechanism, that's... If you just physical. think of anything that is in textbooks, which is a single pole approximation or whatever, yeah. all of those will tell you that this is, and the, the binding energy is smaller than It's the smaller than the gap, yeah. It's something... I mean, okay, if you have something, you have to play with the screening of the, the thing. You have, screening. Yeah, I think that's some. I don't know. It's something. Then maybe you have to separate the charge to bring them this charge transfer type of excitons. They can be pretty high, and then Which depending on the screen yeah. of the thing. So. Okay. Then of course, it, with time resolved methods, there are all these efforts to really yeah photo excite these excitonic insulator states in in, in various of uh, uh, systems and then coming up with all these uh, fascinating phase diagrams of yeah exciton exciton interactions in the system and then okay there are materials where in principle you have also these type of phase diagrams where in principle yeah everything comes from looking at this dome shape that uh, structures that seem to follow this theoretical uh, expectation but in all of these systems, there's not really a proof of a coherent condensate. And here we wanted to try to find these proofs for this new uh, candidate system. Uh, sorry, I missed on the previous slide. Can you go back? Previous yeah. Slide? The bottom one is which material? Uh, this is TMS, oh, that is, okay, right. these types of, of so I think this yeah. one, first candidates. Um, yeah, but yeah, today we want to focus on these uh, yeah, chain compound, tantalum nickel uh, selenide. Here we have this yeah, theoretical phase diagram, and this is believed to be somewhere here on the, on the, on the top between the BCS and BC uh, side. And we've seen already the, the structure of the system. We have this nickel selenium tetrahedra and uh, tantalum selenium octahedra which give us these layers. And then in principle, yeah, we have this charge transfer type of, of exciton in this picture, which then is this yeah, 
system of interest. The data here we have also seen for really looking at transport of this. There is this characteristic kink in the transport going from this semiconducting to insulating behavior. And then if one changes basically the doping or applies pressure, one can reduce this kink temperature, so which means then in this interpretation, reducing the transition temperature, either going to the metallic or to the insulating side. And as Sasha said, there is this compound, this sulfide compound, which is a fully semiconducting uh, material. So all of the measurements that we perform, we usually do, we really measure the tantalum nickel selenide compound and try to compare the features we see also to this sulfide compound. Yeah, one of these striking elements by it is that really these ARPES measurements really showed this characteristic uh, band flattening as we have seen before of the picture. And what will be important for the measurements for us is also let me recall what Sasha just told us in the talk before. Here we have again in the tantalum nickel selenide this uh, opening of this optical gap at low temperatures. And we have seen, Sasha convinced us very nicely, we see in the sulfide, we really could see these Fano-like features, which here might be hidden. But if you see them in compersion, one can really convince oops, uh, that we have these two Fano resonant features here, which then were interpreted basically bringing the spectral weight from the low temperature range to this uh, peak-like feature here. And yeah, so these two energies of these two uh, exciton peaks are then at 210 and 330 milliEV. And the interpretation of this is this, yeah, having <coughs> this yeah, polaronic type of complexes in this, in this system. The question is, OK, how can we really probe coherence? And then we went back to, to experiments on really seeing exciton wave packet dynamics in semiconductors. Yes, yes. This is, is, is there any evidence? This is for all of the spindles of the radius of the exciton. No, that's and something I've asked Sasha several times <laughs> already. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, but that's something. Would be no, I, I, I just answered that, OK, uh, excited state. I, I'm talking about just excited state. Excited is extended uh, exciton from But what's the ground state, I cannot say. Uh, OK, excited, uh, excited state is already extended over the okay. entire crystal. Then it's more vanilla. Yeah. Yeah, it's a charge runs for exciton, but you can assign a vanier radius, sort of. Yeah. So, so we said, okay, how do we find fingerprints of coherence? So we looked what people did in the in the nineties in uh, quantum wells of gallium arsenide. So this is a typical uh, picture here where you have the exciton level sitting below the continuum, and there. So these were experiments by by Jochen Feldman. So they were coming now with an ultra short laser pulse really resonant to the band gap of the system, but with a band width of the laser pulse that it really uh, is across all these exciton levels in the system. So that was shown here. In this case, they really had the covering with their laser and coherent on impulsive excitation of this 1s and 2s states in the system. And then they could see in their experiments these characteristic oscillations. In the system. And then they can tune the laser around and then they came up with the experimental and the theoretical picture of this. And in a nutshell, in principle, what they see, they're populating or they're, they're knocking these exciton levels at the same time with an ultra short laser pulse. And what you see in the experiment basically is a beating between the energy levels of the system. And that shows up as the oscillation. So the oscillation frequency, in principle, gives us the energy difference between the exciton levels. And now, OK, how would this experiment translate to our case? OK, we try now to see exciton dynamics in our system. We, since the band gap in the system is pretty high, this 180 milliEV, we have to scale up our time resolution. So going from the picosecond resolutions of these semiconductor experiments, here we have to go now to sub 10 femtosecond experiments if we want to do something. That is something with our laser systems requires us to pump now far into the continuum. So our excitation is off resonant with all these excitonic modes. So in principle, in our case, we, we think the laser is not impinging coherence into these exciton levels itself. And then we want to see in the following of the talk, OK, extreme time scale dynamics, which is the purely <coughs> electronic dynamics on 10 to 7 time scales. Then we will look at this phonon and coupled phonon dynamics that Eduardo was already mentioning in the first talk, which is happening on the 100 femtosecond, picosecond uh, time scale of 
this system. So what is happening with these carriers? Okay, in some way they have to cool down, they might even then populate these, these higher states, and then the question is, can we see this beating of these uh, energy differences? So, uh, can I ask you something yeah. about the selection rules of this process, in the sense that when you look at these coherences as a function of time, and you yeah. probe with reflectivity, most likely these are Raman active modes. So basically, one should compare then these features with something that comes from spontaneous Raman scattering. Uh, but when you look at excitons, like in the absorption spectrum, yeah. those are dipole allowed, basically. Mm -hmm. So how can you distinguish which is which, or what's going on when you see these coherences of the wave packets? And oh, the wave packets. Yeah. Okay, what you have to do in, in, uh, to make this fully clean is you have to do a four-wave mixing type of experiment, and then it's really like uh, driving the, the um, yeah, the, uh, the, the block oscillations of, this, of these states and something. And, and what we did here is something we focused really, really tight to really basically come in a, in a actually four-wave mixing structure of this, of this experiment. So which the is then the fully that you see are dipole allowed or are Raman active? No, these are, in principle, they are four-wave mixing signals okay. in this part. They are not direct uh, infrared absorptions in this. Okay. OK, the first thing is, OK, let's look at this time domain response. We've seen these. We've seen all these oscillations. And now we are only interested in the electronic response of the system. And the first thing we, we asked ourselves, is this, if this is really an, a condensate, then let's see if we can really distinguish in the time domain if this whole excitation and relaxation is happening across um, uh, temperature dependent or temperature independent gap. So there we took analogies to the research in time resolved excitations in superconductors, where there you saw if you have the relaxation across the pseudo gap, that was a temperature independent picture, or you have a relaxation across the temperature dependent gap of the superconductor, and there you could see in the time domain two time scales due to the different uh, natures of the gap. Something strange with the thing. And then here, if we assume we have a temperature dependent amplitudes and relaxations across a temperature independent gap, then one can up with in this Rodwell Taylor pictures, one comes up with these descriptions for the uh, excitation and relaxation dynamics in the system. If we compare this with our system here, then we can find that for the tantal nickel selenide, we find a description that holds up to temperatures of yeah, about 250 Kelvin with a full description of a uh, excitation and relaxation across a temperature independent gap of roughly 100 milliEV, which given the error bars is uh, okay with these 160 MeV for, for uh, two delta that we have seen uh, before. There might be a small feature happening here around 250 where yeah, we attribute this, this is possibly some contribution from a BCS type of behavior that would give a jump-like uh, feature in this thing, but also there really as soon as you have such a phase transition, for example, in, in, in superconductors, you also know new dephasing channels for phonons and so on would open. And if you look, for example, now at phonons, these are these coherent oscillations that are uh, on the back on here. If we extract them by so subtracting the electronics, up to three phonons three. we have there. And then if we look, for example, here, these are now the dephasing times of the three terahertz uh, coherent phonon. Then we see also around these 250, we also have somehow new dephasing channels that set in around this uh, 250 Kelvin in the system. So, so the, as you said, the, the, you're, you're getting three overtones, you don't see anything more. But also, they gradually seem to be shifting in phase. The, so, so the question is, are you really generating three phonons which interfere, or are you generating a nonlinear dynamics which involves one harmonic, two harmonics, three harmonics? No, no, these are three phonons that interfere. That's what we see. So, and you know that because they're gradually shifting as a function of time. Yeah, yeah. We have one. So they're, different, uh, yeah. they're in different yeah, places. Okay, so I have many, many extra plots, but this plot I don't have, but I can show it to you later, where we really can disentangle when which phone is starting and to ring. Can you state the frequencies again? One is one terahertz. One, two, and three terahertz. One, two, and three. <laughs> very, very that's, simple. Yeah, that's I can remember. Point something, something, and so on. <laughs> okay. And, and am I correct that this 270K anomaly that I mean, yeah, yeah, 250k, yeah, yeah, yeah. 50k is something which is not understood. Not understood. So it's something, something is happening there. We want to try also to measure now on this whole 
either with pressure or in the substituted samples to see if this is shifting around, if this is somehow related to a typical BEC, BCS type of crossover thing. Because if there would be a BCS type of contribution that could come in here, that could be sensitive to, to this. But we don't know. That's pure speculation. But at least the feature, we could fit this if we would put a little BCS contribution on top. But if this is uh, a good suggestion or not, I can only tell if we've measured at least three or four other samples and we see how this feature uh, changes. OK, the interesting part is now to get what is happening really at these extreme electronic time scales on the, on the <laughs> very first picosecond. And here I show you, OK, this is the electronic signal. And this is really pretty fast. It is happening on a 250 femtosecond time scale in this electronic part. So it's a little bit faster than the, the valence band response that Eduardo uh, was reporting. But if I now subtract this electronic signal of this, these are the oscillations I'm uh, left with. Here you see these slow oscillations that will become the coherent phonons in the system. So I think this will become the three terahertz mode in the system. But now let's look on the, the spectrum of these oscillations. And that is shown here. So this spectrum is dominated by three peaks that are shown here. This peak here I grayed out because that's really, uh, we are really dealing here with perturbed pre-induction decay. We are very short with these pulses. And this is an, an artifact in principle by the polarization that is induced already by the probe pulse into the system and is pumped by the But that's something we can understand. But yeah, we want to ignore this before this question comes. It's a peak, we understand why it's there, it's changing, and so that's why it's, it's fair to, to gray it out. But the other peaks we really want to discuss now. First, these two peaks, which are happening at 30 and 35 terahertz, that corresponds to roughly 124 and 145 milli EV. And now if we go back to, to Sasha's data, and we see here the two exciton peaks at one and two with 210 and 330 milli EV, the energy difference between these two is 120. That is exactly where we are seeing this first beating. So that's why we identify this one basically as the beating uh, energy of these two exciton peaks. If we now say, OK, to some rough order, there should be something like a hydrogen-like or a Rydberg series in the system, then we can calculate from this beating uh, frequency in principle also what would be the, the binding energy of such a system. That would be then four thirds of this 120 milli EV. That would be 160 milli EV. That is also where you see the gap in the system, which is it's fine. And then if you take this and you would say, okay, where would be now the E1 to E3 beating in such a system? Mm -hmm. That would be eight ninths of the uh, binding energy. That would be around about 140 milli EV, 34.3 terahertz. And that is exactly where we see this uh, green peak here. So we would interpret this peak as an E1 to E3 beating in the system with this part. The question is now, OK, can we see also now some oscillations really at the band gap of the system? And that is something, OK, here we, we're looking, OK, in, in superconductors, that would be the equivalent of the Higgs mode. If we have these, yeah, OK, assuming a U1 type of uh, picture, OK, that would be the, the fight for the phase, or in this case, for the amplitude modes of the system. And since we can't really directly excite these modes, OK, we would do this quench type of excitation. If we come with this very short laser pulse, we would basically quench the potential fast compared to the eigen mode of the system. So now the system sees a new potential minimum and now starts oscillating around this new potential minimum. That's the the way how in ultra-fast experiments we are exciting amplitude or also uh, Higgs modes in the system. But then this would, yeah, the, the theory tells us then we, this oscillation around this new minimum should happen really at the energy of the gap, which in this case is 160 milli EV. That would, would translate to 38 terahertz of the system. And that is exactly where we find this really broad mode here. System. So in that sense, this is a possible observation of really an electronic amplitude mode of this uh, excitonic insulator in the system. So I still don't understand one uh, aspect that is more related to your you know, experimental setup, which yeah. is, is that an impulsive Raman experiment, or it's more like Th this mode? We this mode we would interpret really as an impulsive, uh, it's not really impulsive Raman type, but it's, it's like, oh, the this analogon to this. It's, the very same way as you would excite uh, the Higgs modes in ultra-fast yeah. experiments. Whereas the other two modes 
are excited by a four-way mixing, but exactly. you're still having a pump probe configuration. Like it's still a pump probe configuration. Pump exactly, probe. exactly. So how can you get four-way mixing out of no. that? Okay, I can show you the, the experimental setup. Okay. That. That's a, because that's really a technical, a technical thing okay. on this. So as we excite this guy, which is yeah. basically the, the other parameter, yeah. Right? Yeah. we should also see the phonons that are mm -hmm. immediately coupled linearly to it do yeah. something. Ring, yeah, yeah, whatever. but that's really something. And, and this is higher frequency guys, right? These are potentially right? higher frequency guys. In this so is this something that could be probed? That's something we are trying to probe now. With this experimental setup, this is an, an oscillator source, we could not extend this. But we are planning at the moment exactly experiments to really find these couplings exactly. that you're talking yeah. about. And what's the experimental challenge? It's the frequency range where the, the frequency phonons range are. where the photons are, but also it's, you need very short pulses, and we really want to do this really at gap. So this one is shooting really into the continuum, mm -hmm. and now we are really planning to do these experiments really exactly resonant to gap with a broadband pulse. So we really see also how the whole gap will evolve as a function of time with fill in or shift. But what about kind of standard old fashioned? <laughs> On what? On yeah, I mean, these, the, yeah, these, these are these are you know, Miles Klein tile type experiments, right? I mean, the, the, uh, yeah, but the fashion way of doing it in this yeah. range, it wouldn't be so hard. Right? Yeah, yeah, we tried, but we didn't see these features in appearing clearly in the Raman thing. We had a extensive. So you fight. mean those mod so so the mods we are to talking about are, for example, the tilting of the selenium, right? That's ah, okay, no, no, the the, the, the phonon modes we see. The phonon the modes we right, see. But, but, but no, no, but these these amplitude the, modes. So the, the question about the coupling of the yeah. phonon modes to all of these things, which in principle should be there, yeah. if they're real modes, phonons would leak into these things and then. Yeah, yeah. no, no, phonons we have. We have all the phonons. But, but you don't yeah, see, but you don't see these. This, uh, this we don't see. We don't see uh, yeah, so Raman modes at these frequencies. So they're not coupled to phones. Otherwise, you'd see them. They'd mix. Okay. No, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. But that's something. Yeah, we we tried to look for these modes in in the Raman spectra in the linear, but we didn't see anything there. We only see the the phonon modes in the. No, no, but wait a second. Those are not the phonon modes we are talking about. What, no. are, what is the frequency of these tilting phonon modes? Ah, these are all terahertz frequencies, maybe tens of terahertz. This is 40 terahertz, so this is really... The phonon spectra I have at the end, so this is really... What do you mean, up. this is 400 terahertz? This no, is this is 40, 40 terahertz. Yeah. No, not 5 terahertz, 40 terahertz. And the guys I'm talking about are what? Few terahertz. Few terahertz, 5, 6, okay. 7 at most. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So that would be, yeah, that is the what we said, okay, that would be a possible electronic uh, amplitude mode of the system. And we said, okay, if so, what is the temperature dependence of this mode? And we see here, okay, there's not much going on. There's a slight decrease approaching TC, and then at TC, yeah, it goes down somewhere at most 10% within this. So these error bars look terrible. Then if we compare this with the analysis of the of the ARPAS data, then it looks like this, so the, the blue dots. So then it doesn't look so bad anymore. So for instance, we are following what is seen as the, the, the gap that is evaluated from, from these ARPUS measurements. And we are, we are in agreement with this. So we have a similar behavior compared to the, to the, to the ARPUS gap in this system. That's what we can, can say for this. If we really want to see now, OK, our interpretation here is this, OK, we have this exciton wave packet beating for these two sharp peaks. And then we have this broad peak here, which we interpret really now as a potential uh, electronic amplitude mode. So really, uh, yeah, that would be something like a Higgs-like equivalent for this system. However, if you really see this, OK, if we clock this transition, now I really zoom in here into this measurement, and we subtract, we really see the electronic signal has this yeah, roughly 250 uh, femtoseconds rise time on, on, on this system. And if we now want to see when do these things set in, so we did something like a time window FFT, which one has to take with a grain of salt because the resolution of this is super poor, but it allows us somehow to give the center of gravity when which mode is setting in on this transition. And then we really find, basically, we have an instant peaking of this yeah, amplitude Higgs-like mode that is happening. So something like after 60 femtoseconds or whatever we have the onset of this dynamics with plus minus 10 femtoseconds. But this is then well separated from really this center of weight where these uh, exciton wave packet beating sets in, which is somewhere 150 femtoseconds later than this first response. And then the full 
electronic response we see to be complete within 250 femtoseconds of this thing. So that also shows, okay, the nature of these two types of oscillations is really clearly different of, of this part. But then the strange question is still, okay, now this is a really, if you, if you look at the full signal, the full coherent signal is really, all this beating seems to be basically gone within a few hundred femtoseconds. So uh, at a picosecond, this whole electronic beating is not visible anymore in the system. And that is somehow puzzling. You said, okay, how can this, if this should really be a pure electronic system that should lead to uh, forming a condensate, these time scales somehow don't match on these parts. And then we said, okay, we had this picture of these, yeah, polaronic complexes from, from, from Sasha in mind. I said, okay, let's see if we can find oh, some couplings. I'm sorry, I missed your point. Can you just go back and say that again? Why is it that the two different time scales that you observe here argue that you need to have some other physics like polaronic condensates and that it's not yeah. just one electron ah, so complex? I mean, after all, different kind of collective modes, amplitude and phase might have different time scales to turn on, even in the absence of polaronic things. That could be it. Here it's something, these time scales, there was something when we looked, for example, in all these uh, efforts to photo use these excitonic insulators, where they also have these arguments, okay, on which time scales they see the shrinking of the line widths and so on. That is where we, we got numbers from where they said, okay, you need really several picoseconds mm -hmm. on, on, yeah, coherence time. So before you could identify really an an excitonic insulator photo induced on this. So, um, and that was an argument on these time scales, all these people we talked to, they told us, okay, that is in principle a time scale that is too fast to really form condensation, at least in the photo excited. Uh, but then why do you want to have a polaron which is a lattice thing which would be even slower? Mm -hmm. I guess that was ah, the logical point. If, then, if you would have then a coupled system, <coughs> then in principle, if the coherence then is mediated via this complex or whatever, that would give you, of course, a slower coherence time scale, and then the lifetimes are long enough to, to really start condensation in the system. Uh, if I am afraid you have to conclude the talk. Yeah, OK. So then we have the, the, the key picture we've seen already in uh, Eduardo's measurement that we have these phonon, coherent phonon spectrum in the system, where this mode here at 3 terahertz really behaves like we would expect from a coherent phonon and also comparing this with the, with the Raman of the data. However, if we look at this 1 terahertz mode down here, we really see this amplitude of these oscillations really follows this behavior that really looks like a mean field type of uh, order parameter. And that made us believe, OK, somehow, maybe we have somehow now a, a phonon mode that is coupling to the excitonic order. And that our idea was, OK, maybe this gives us also a knob if we can drive this mode to really also control the order in the system. Not necessarily that this is a necessary part to form the order for all the discussions that we had in the system. I'm going to Peter, the question. If that's the case, yeah. the width of the one terahertz mode should be much wider. And it's too narrow. It is very narrow in, to, in to be coupled to something. Yeah, but there's even more. So it's, what is quite interesting for this? First, to see, okay, is this just sharing spectral weight? That would be something where the mode would become width wide and whatever. Or is it really now we said, okay, this is really a behavior that really looks like an independent amplitude mode, which has both an electronic amplitude mode character and still the phononic characters. So for, for strongly coupled phonon superconductors, something like this was predicted, theoretically at least. And therefore, we also looked at the fluence dependence for the phonons. OK, they go like this. But these modes really show us also, OK, they don't grow with intensity. They grow really with the field. And then at a temperature dependent threshold, we really see also a depletion. Because we also, if you drive the system stronger and stronger, we start to kick out more excitons from a condensate. Actually, well, what's, what's wrong with the story that it's just weakly coupled? I mean, so there are plenty of, look, if you cool phonons through TC, they all move a little bit, it? because yeah. the electronic compressibility changes, yeah. there's a little yeah. bit of but then we should, little, little then bit we should, of shift. Then we should see this behavior always, because that's then maybe one more evidence. If we now do the same experiment with even weaker fluences, we also see this coupled behavior goes away. So it really sets in. But I, 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 the question is, is it 
no, no, it, it, look, it, look, if, I, if I send yeah. sound waves through yeah. a solid, even though they may be weakly coupled to some yeah. phase transition, I'll typically get a little glitch as I go through yeah. the transition. But then I would see this in Raman as well, in conventional frequency domain Raman. And I don't see this. I only see this in this driven, driven modes. That is something, yeah, this behavior is really completely different from, from, from Raman. This is not, as we've heard yesterday, an expensive variable in Raman. It's a really a behavior that is distinct from the normal Raman, and it's also seen in the frequency dependence of this mode. So then in Raman, this mode has no frequency dependence. In this case, it gets frequency dependence. So you can take the whole picture, and you can also look at the frequencies, and you also see exactly these distinctions. And you can also distinguish it from the same mode in the sulfide compound, which is the semiconducting compound, and there we don't have this behavior. So there it behaves like all the other coherent phonons and uh, uh, the Raman modes. On top of this is now the question on coupled or not. It's something, if it's really an amplitude mode, we said, then it should also modulate the gap. And then the question was, OK, how can this happen? So if this is our excitonic potential, now we so come with a laser. We really have to uh, we come. already 10 minutes. Yeah. OK, then we had one picture where we really said, OK, we come up with something that we really have a combined oscillation of this mode with the potential. The proof would be to see this in Raman. And indeed, we can see probing this in Terah uh, sorry, in Raman, in terahertz, low frequencies, we can also see coherent oscillations really at one terahertz in the, in the in the gap, deep in the gap of this. And that's something we can really see now in, in, in reflection, in transmission, we really see these coherent oscillations also on the full gap response of the system. And then finally, just let's leave us with the motion of this one terahertz mode. And it's really this mode, if you look along these chains, that is really changing the buckling of this layer in this system. And it's also moving in the selenium atoms to the middle. Yeah, and with this, yeah, let's just keep up with the with the summary of, of this, with the yeah, key findings of the electronic coherence and this yeah, phonon coupled mode that shows this interesting behavior that we are now trying to bring together. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.